Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lee, and I'm Professor of Physics at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University. Today's public talk is part of an initiative at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The primary goal of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the great pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Eva Silverstein entitled The Cosmological Horizon, Macrostates and Microstates. Eva Silverstein is Professor of Physics at Stanford University and Director of the Modern Inflationary Cosmology Collaboration with the Simons Foundation's Origins of the Universe Initiative. She received her PhD from Princeton University in 1996, and she is a fellow of the American Physical Society, MacArthur Foundation, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research interests include cosmic inflation, string theory, black hole physics, and the development of physics-based methods for machine learning. The early universe expanded at a rapidly accelerating rate, and some imprints of this period are detected in telescopes, measuring tiny fluctuations in the light produced at the time when atoms first formed. Silverstein's leading work connects this early period of cosmic inflation with the fundamentals of quantum physics and gravity, showing how this is amenable to tests with astronomical observations. Silverstein's work also addresses the problem of developing more comprehensive laws of quantum physics and gravity, taking into account the, acceler uh, the accelerated expansion. If you have any questions during this talk, please type them into the chat or question and answer dialog box. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Silverstein. Oh, thank you very much, Dean, for that excessively kind introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting this and interacting with, with the group. So the theme of this talk will be the, as it says, the cosmological horizon, um, which is implicated in a very beautiful and simple and successful theory of the origin of structure in the universe on the one hand. So we'll go through that and its sensitivity to um, sort of higher energy theory. Um, and then if we get time, we'll also consider the more general problem of uh, how to interpret the thermodynamic properties of the cosmological horizon, which carries um, a large number of so-called microstates, which are not observable, but can be studied and analyzed through um, what we call thought experiments in theoretical physics. So uh, with that brief um, summary, let me get going, although even though we tested it, I'm having trouble moving the slides. Um, okay, let's see, there we go. Okay, so let me start with um, a kind of cartoon picture of our modern theory of classical gravity, which is Einstein's general relativity. Um, in words, this is a set of equations which describes how the geometry of space-time interacts with energy and pressure of matter. So um, colloquially, one can say that the matter tells the space-time how to curve, and the curved space-time tells the matter how to move. Um, and as we'll discuss um, at some length, uh, this theory predicts you know, all sorts of things, including very extreme conditions, such as black holes and accelerated expansion of space itself uh, in, a, in a cosmological sense. So roughly speaking, we have this set of equations that relate curvature of space-time, space-time geometry to energy. Okay, so there are various ways that we can describe the geometry. Um, uh, let me briefly say that there's a particular mathematical object called a metric tensor, which is basically a way of combining intervals of length in different directions um, that tells us the geometry by giving us lengths between points in the geometry and angles between uh, vectors in the geometry. So let, let me actually, start with something that I think everybody knows from, from high school, which is the Pythagorean theorem, where we can 
take uh, two points and calculate the distance between them, the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle I've drawn, in terms of the coordinate distances delta x and delta y between the two points. And so we have the famous formula delta s squared, the hypotenuse length squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared. Um, now there's a generalization of this to include not just spatial directions, um, but time as well. And there, um, for reasons that you know, you can learn actually pretty quickly by studying some classic uh, material on, on what's called special relativity, the appropriate generalization of the Pythagorean theorem is um, this expression that I've written here, um, where uh, similar, but we have a, a delta t, an interval in time, in the time coordinate, um, multiplied by the speed of light, which converts the, the delta t to a distance. And uh, also we have the, the delta x squared and delta y squared, and also delta z squared for the third spatial dimension. So um, there's a notion of length in a space-time, um, which, which takes this form. Um, and the key properties that it has include that uh, the light cone, so massless particle propagation in general, um, has in this metric zero distance. Um, it's so-called null rays, and that's the, the light cone in this picture where the, the lines in orange are going at the speed of light, delta x, delta t equals c, the speed of light, which is, has this numerical value. And um, the other thing to know is that most particles, with, you know, which are ones with some mass, um, propagate slow, more slowly than that. So they're inside the light cone. So nothing can move faster than light. Um, and this is our mathematical way of expressing that. Okay. Um, so ne the next step is to recognize that we can, what I described in the last slide here was all flat space. But if, um, if we want to consider a curved space, we need a, a very natural generalization of, of this uh, delta S squared thing, uh, which we can do um, in, in this way. So mathematically, we can write a similar formula that has co coefficients, the, the metric tensor coefficients, uh, which depend non-trivially on the coordinates t, x, y, and z. Um, in general, when you write such an expression, you, you describe a geometry which is not flat, um, but uh, if it doesn't have any particularly singular behavior, and you zoom into a small enough region, then you'll have a, a flat patch of it that works identically to what we discussed on the previous slide. And this formula patches together these locally flat regions. Um, and a key uh, principle is that the physical laws are independent of the coordinate system that we describe them in. So um, that includes boosting to move at a relative velocity or rotating the picture. Um, all, all the way back in, in this picture, we could have gotten a similar distance um, between two points. Rotating them doesn't change that. Um, okay. So uh, this theory um, that we just very briefly introduced, uh, as I already mentioned, it has solutions. That is, solutions to those equations, R equals E or curvature equals energy, in which um, we see very interesting um, and quite extreme behaviors. One example being a black hole, where there is an, a horizon, um, which has the property that uh, there's some region beyond which light cannot escape to the region outside the horizon here. Um, and we, we depict that in a certain diagram that I've drawn here, where you might have some observer outside the black hole, something inside the black hole that simply can't send signals out at the classical level. In cosmology, um, a similar effect happens when we consider the case where space is expanding with time, as in this formula. So this is a particular example of a metric in which uh, the coefficient e to the 2ht here is describing indeed how space expands as a function of time t. Um, and with this type of exponential expansion or accelerated expansion in general, what you find is that uh, observers lose contact in a very similar way to in this picture, uh, uh, though you know, there are many aspects that are, that are different, but in, in the respect of having a horizon in this picture on the right, it works as follows. If you start with two points that are close together, space stretches them apart to such an extent that at later times, if they try to send a signal to each other, they simply fail. The light cannot reach um, from one to the other. 
Um, again, it's it's useful to draw a certain diagram of that, which accentuates the causal structure, this business of who can communicate with whom. Um, and so this square here for the accelerated expansion of the universe is, is the cosmological version of this diagram that I mentioned over here. Um, this corresponds to something many people would have heard of, which is the famous positive cosmological constant. So that uh, lambda denotes a, an energy density that doesn't dilute and which um, in the Einstein equations, R equals E, generate this, this uh, solution to those equations. Um, and just for those who like equations, let me spell that out a little bit more. So here's the metric tensor, not yet committing to what this A of T function is. Um, uh, the Einstein equations with this kind of simple, spatially homogeneous um, uh, proposal for or hypothesis for the solution, the equations boil down to something really very simple um, with this row um, now de denoting the energy density um, and the way that it uh, couples or generates or sources uh, changes in the geometry is controlled by an important parameter in, in physics known as the Planck uh, mass scale, um, written in terms of other fundamental constants like the Planck constant for uh, quantum mechanics, the speed of light we already mentioned, it's, it's basically the inverse of the famous Newton constant that describes the strength of gravitational interactions. This mass scale is ginormous compared to, say, the GeV scale of nuclear physics, um, which by this huge factor of 10 to the 18. Um, but we, we under this, the role of this scale is, is very, very clear, um, and we'll say more about it in future slides. At this level, it's just telling us how, um, how strongly it is that matter couples to geometry. The equation is the simple thing I've written here. And the solution, um, if you've seen some calculus, is, is given by the exponential form of this A of t that I wrote earlier. Um, just a dot equals constant times a. Um, you get the exponential solution. So this is an example of how those Einstein equations apply to describe a pretty dramatic solution. Um, so just to recap a little bit, we have uh, we have a, uh, a horizon generated by the ex exponential expansion. So we, we have these two observers. They're drawn apart so strongly that light cannot reach between them. Um, it's often useful to, to spell out the analogy with black holes slightly more. It's often useful bec because of the horizon to focus um, on what a given observer can meaningfully access. And so uh, as usual, as I mentioned, I mean, you, you can describe the same geometry using different kinds of coordinate systems. Um, and one that's useful within an, an observer patch, uh, the patch that, that an observer uh, can access outside the horizon um, ha has a form like this that's, uh, if you notice the form of the black hole horizon uh, over here, it's very, very similar, um, and that's not an accident. Okay, um, those details won't matter much for what I'm going going toward, but uh, uh, there it is. Now, the, this is not just theory, although there is a great history of thought experiments in physics, um, and relativity is an example where um, it was a great uh, interaction between theory and experiment, but required a lot of <laughs> abstraction to get it correct. Um, but it's very important, of course, that these are not just theoretical extremes, they are um, seen in nature. And with black holes, uh, there are various beautiful ways that's been happening of late. So um, for example, a long, uh, long study of orbits surrounding the central black hole in our galaxy established its existence. Um, LIGO, the gravitational wave detector, detected clear signals of mergers involving black holes, and the Event Horizon Telescope has been taking widely separated radio telescopes and inferring a, a kind of image of black hole horizons in the centers of, of galaxies. So these are, you know, real, and they arise from various, very, very super interesting astrophysical processes. So, so um, even yeah. maybe for those who don't know so much about black holes, you can talk a little bit more about what exactly is a black hole. When do you have a black hole? Things like that. Well, okay, good. So yes, good idea. So, um, well, here's this 
ugly little picture of, of it. Um, if you take matter and you compress it uh, to a significant enough extent, then um, you find this phenomenon that I described earlier where uh, the matter, which is kind of depicted in green in this diagram, um, has compressed so much that it causes the space on cur curvature outside to produce this system where the, the light rays from, from a region inside can, cannot get to the outside. So uh, another way of saying it is at the event horizon, this horizon is called, uh, the escape velocity is the speed of light. So um, then when you drop in, you, there's, you know, there's no escape velocity. You just can't get out. Thank you. Um, uh, great. Um, so, okay, so that's the black hole side. The, the uh, business about the accelerated expansion is also um, observed astrophysically. So this happens um, both in the late universe in a kind of, in a very important, but sort of mild way. Uh, and there's also a lot of evidence for it having happened in the early universe. Um, so in the late universe, uh, one uses various, independent probes of the expansion history of the universe, this business about how this function A of T uh, evolves in time. And it was a quite a blockbuster um, announcement when about 20 years ago, people all these all these observations kind of overlapped on the conclusion that cosmology did require this new parameter, um, this uh, cosmological constant, meaning a source of stress energy that doesn't dilute uh, in order to, to model these observations. Um, and it's a tiny number compared to the fundamental scale and Planck of gravity. Um, it's also tiny compared to all the particle physics scales that, that we know. Um, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful observation. Um, so in the early universe, uh, there's also enormous evidence for actually a much stronger form of accelerated expansion having happened, and then um, and then uh, that stress energy source having diluted uh, later um, to give us the intermediate history that we see of uh, much slower expansion. So uh, the simplest model of, of those observations is to take a scalar field, a kind of degree of freedom that permeates all space and time. Um, so just such a thing can carry potential energy and kinetic energy the way that ordinary particles can. And the potential energy of such a scalar field that I've denoted V of phi, the scalar field phi, um, when it's approximately constant, then it generates the kind of accelerated expansion that we discussed earlier. Um, and then uh, when the potential energy dies down, it stops generating that. And that's how we have this early universe acceleration known as inflation exiting to a phase of more mild expansion. Okay, so there are many reasons that theorists propose this at a kind of macroscopic level, but let's focus on a beautiful and very important implication that it had that was then tested, which is that once you hypothesize such a field in nature, um, as we said just a moment ago, it, it, it's a physical degree of freedom every, at every point in space and time. And like everything else, it's subject to quantum mechanics, which means it has irreducible fluctuations. So um, it's not just about the macroscopic homogeneous expansion of space. It's also uh, the case that this degree of freedom has implications for beyond, beyond that, for inhomogeneities uh, in the system. So um, a field has vacuum fluctuations. That's another way of saying um, that it uh, undergoes quantum fluctuations. It, um, uh, another way of saying it, which we'll get to in a moment, is that its uh, amplitude is, and its momentum in the field sense, uh, cannot both be known. And so it, it's subject to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, uh, like every other physical degrees of freedom. As a result, it, there's some fluctuations going on in the vacuum. And when you combine that with the accelerated expansion of the system, the wavelength of those fluctuations stretches in the exponential way governed by this A of T function that we keep talking about. And um, 
the scale of that expansion H here, which is known as Hubble, um, defines a length scale of the horizon. And um, as the wavelength stretches outside the, the Hubble horizon, uh, the mode, um, this little wave packet here, freezes out um, until much later in the in the problem where the uh, accelerated expansion ends and, and that degree of freedom can come back into the observational patch of the universe. Um, and what happens then is that these essential irreducible quantum fluctuations seed structure that then grows in the universe. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so Eva, I just wanted to, to make an announcement. So uh, Forrest Stevers uh, is saying that the chat doesn't seem to be working quite well. So if you have a question, use the question and answer dialog box, uh, just to let you know. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, just to spell it out, is, is this fact that for every quantum mechanical degree of freedom, every physical degree of freedom in nature, um, you can't know it and its and its motion at the same time perfectly. There's a there's an irreducible lower bound on the uncertainty in one times the uncertainty in the other, and the this field phi that I mentioned, uh, which we call the impliton, um, uh, having to do with its role generating early universe acceleration, which is called cosmic inflation. Um, so that, that field cannot sit still and it has to fluctuate a little bit. Okay, so um, what I described so far um, at this level would produce a distribution of fluctuations that is a, the famous normal distribution, a, a kind of Gaussian distribution for all of the modes of this field um, or equally the field at, at all points in space and time. <clears throat> so that... Um, is a specific functional form for the, um, to be a little more fancy, the quantum wave function of these fluctuations, um, just, just introducing the variable and applying the uh, uncertainty principle in the way I described would, would give you a, a normal distribution. Uh, but there are interactions in uh, among the fields in the early universe as there are in uh, the later universe. And those, uh, one of the things we'll get toward is how those interactions affect uh, this leading order uh, estimate for the distribution of fluctuations. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, how is it that we get some sort of observational handle on that? Well, basically, it's a beautiful story having to do with the light, the cosmic microwave background that streams to us relatively uninhibited uh, once atoms have formed in the universe. Um, and this happened about uh, when the universe was about a thousand times uh, smaller than it is today. Um, so uh, that's a long time ago in itself, this period when atoms formed. But the more exciting thing is that, in fact, the plasma uh, of forming atoms, electrons and protons and neutrons and such, um, is sensitive to the fluctuations that happened even earlier, um, the ones having to do with uh, the field phi that I described earlier. Um, so it has to do with how those early universe fluctuations um, imprint themselves on the light that comes from the atoms forming uh, at uh, this time, which is called recombination when, when um, electrons and protons bound themselves into the simplest atoms. Um, then the universe evolves and the laws of physics as we understand them have the uh, effect of, of coalescing structures in the universe. Um, that's uh, largely because of gravity interacting with other forces of nature. And this also, um, if you look at the distribution of galaxies that form that way in the universe, um, that, that so-called large-scale structure, the statistics of that also carries an imprint of these primordial fluctuations. So it is from these data sets, if you wish, that uh, one can test theories like the one that I just summarized. Okay, so um, on the right panel here, I'm showing um, the plots that correspond to that uh, in the case of uh, the leading approximation to these fluctuations in um, 
or delta phi or phi to the field that become fluctuations in the energy scale or the temperature of the microwave background. So this microwave background is three degree Kelvin plus tiny fluctuations of order 10 to the minus five. Um, and yet it's detectable by these wonderful um, observatories. And what's, what's shown here, uh, what you should get out of these plots is simply that uh, there's a theory of those initial conditions um, that I summarized the gist of earlier. It propagates into the observations of the microwave background um, in a way that with very few parameters uh, takes the form of this um, curve that I've drawn and the data points sit beautifully on, on this curve, just having to tune a few parameters having to do with, uh, for example, exactly what the, or not exactly, but to good approximation, what uh, the Hubble expansion is, what um, the fraction of, of different energy contributions in the universe is, including dark matter, as well as observed light, light matter and so on. Um, and the uh, point here is that the theory fits the observations in a spectacularly beautiful way, um, so much so that it gives us the chance to do more with these data sets and use them to probe um, more uh, you know, interesting aspects of the early universe physics that was going on. Um, but it's all based on uh, this, this uh, leading success of, of precision cosmology over the last decades. So, so in, 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 yes, yes. So, so even maybe for those people who are not familiar with why we think inflation is, is reasonable, why, why, you know, it, it, right, it solves this problem of the homogeneity that, that you look at all different directions in the sky and, and you see the same sort of behavior from, from this cosmic microwave background, right? And, and it's hard to explain that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So yeah, I only quickly mentioned that there are um, macroscopic arguments for that and you just summarized it, it beautifully. So um, if you took a model of the universe going back in time that did not contain the accelerated expansion effect, the inflation, um, you'd be very confused about the homoge overall homogeneity uh, of, of, for example, the, the CMB that, that Dean just mentioned. And the reason is that as you go back in time uh, without having encountering a, a time of accelerated expansion, you would hit a, a, a so everything's getting um, kind of smushed together as you go back in time, and you would hit a, a time at which you reach a scale where all that energy is in um, a density that is at the highest energy scale that we that we understand, um, or really higher than we understand, say the Planck energy density. And, um, and yet, if you look at where the sources of the radiation would be that comes to us that we see from all directions, it would have come um, in such a way that those sources were never in contact. They, they were never able to communicate with light. And so it's as if you have this almost you know, I identical temperature everywhere for no good reason, because the sources of, of that light, of that um, temperature, were never in what we call thermal equilibrium. They could never have mixed, um, mixed up and formed something with the same temperature in, in, a, in any kind of familiar way. And so this was regarded as a, as a serious puzzle. I mean, it could just be uh, that that's how it is, but it demanded an explanation. Um, similarly, just the overall you know, homogeneity that we see to good approximation before we get into these small fluctuations um, is something that accelerated expansion gives you very naturally. So if, even if you start with very large fluctuations, this accelerated expansion will kind of dead, dead them out. And so the, you could postulate there was a lot going on. It got, it got uh, diluted rapidly by the accelerated expansion. And then these essential quantum fluctuations kick in. They can't be diluted away. And they are the things that form the structure that we just uh, described. So yeah, Great. thank you for the question. I hope that if that does help. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Okay, so just for fun, let me also mention the uh, version of, of that sort of thing that, that occurs for black holes. And, th and what that is, is the famous Hawking radiation. So in the case of the black hole horizon, you have these still fields around, you have fluctuations. Um, and in the case of the black hole, those fluctuations imply uh, radiation from the black hole uh, that eventually uh, decays the black hole away. Um, and 
so it's a, it's a similar effect uh, with somewhat different uh, implications, including uh, a puzzle that's uh, been going on, gotten a little closer to a solution recently, uh, having to do with how that radiation carries off the information about what formed the black hole in the first place. Um, okay, so um, here, let me just give you a very, very big picture description of, of, um, of, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to move the stuff around. Um, let me give you a big picture. Okay, sorry, I'm just doing some zoom. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so just very big picture <laughs> uh, view of uh, theoretical cosmology. So um, we're some observers in some uh, you know trajectory in this huge uh, cosmology that we understand very little of. Um, there's a region within the universe that we can observe. So given the finite speed of light and the cosmological horizon, um, in general, we, we can't uh, you know, see beyond a certain uh, radius. And what we can see within our observable radius is quite spectacular. It includes the CMB, the galaxies, and so on that I just uh, discussed. Um, and you know that, that, that's a yeah, full interest. Um, but we can't help asking, well, what's beyond that? Um, uh, and, you know, it'd be extraordinarily self-absorbed of us to imagine that there's nothing beyond it and <laughs> the only, only things we can see are, are what exists. Um, instead, uh, we imagine there's much beyond the horizon and we'd like to understand what physical principles imply about that to the extent possible. Um, so um, later in the talk, if we get there, we'll, we'll discuss uh, some of those um, more uh, thought experimental, so to speak, aspects of the horizon. We talked a moment ago about Hawking radiation. The horizon has a temperature. Um, it also has an entropy, according to classic calculations. And um, this entropy really demands a, a microphysical explanation. And so, uh, in addition to the observational cosmology that gives us an ac access to early universe field dynamics, uh, we're interested in these sort of broader questions about how um, quantum gravity uh, works and, and, for example, what the microphysical count of, of states might be that's related to the thermodynamic properties of, of the horizon, things like the temperature and, um, and the entropy. Um, we'll say more about that later in the talk. I'm just trying to give you a big picture view here of what we're dealing with. Coming back into the observable patch, um, there's a lot that we want to learn um, based on the success of the theory that I just very quickly summarized. Um, so as I mentioned, we expect interactions and we expect that this quantum wave function that governs the perturbations is not perfectly Gaussian. We also expect uh, gravitational perturbations, not just uh, perturbations of the the scalar field phi that I that I focused on so far, um, and so uh, there's a large research pro, 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 you know program going on both to uh, understand the large scale structure of the universe uh, well enough to really make um, reliable inferences about cosmological parameters, including ones that enter into these important details of the early universe quantum fields. Um, as well as understanding the, the principles of such inflationary models, um, what kind of high energy physics they're sensitive to and why, and what kind of signatures are useful to test and how. Okay, so that's um, a big picture. The picture could get even bigger if we imagine that in uh, gravity, not only is geometry fluctuating, but so is so-called topology. So there's no real reason that the universe has to have just one connected component. I mean, it can get very wild, but it's a possibility uh, that we have to consider um, that uh, even this connected picture is not enough. Okay, so we have our work cut out for us um, and it's a wonderful subject in part because it does span the gamut from really wonderful hard-nosed you know, observables, empirical tests of things that are interesting, as well as um, thought experimental matters that are, um, that are very intriguing. Okay.
So in terms of the sensitivity, so one of the bullet points I listed here is what I'm calling UV sensitivity. And a more fun name for that is something called dangerous irrelevance, which has to do with the sensitivity to all this stuff, uh, even the observable stuff to um, high energy physics. Um, so let me go into that a little bit next. Well, so we can think, we can, you know, to some extent we can organize our knowledge of uh, certain aspects of physics having to do with uh, you know, particles and gravity and such things uh, by, by energy scales. So there's a certain set of energy scales at which people can do um, real experiments, you know, often quite large scale experiments, but um, accessible on earth, things that have led us to know the particle contents of, of, um, of physics. Um, and of course, there's a lot of very interesting physics to be done to understand when those particles interact strongly and so on as in nuclear physics and condensed matter physics and um, it's far from a, a done deal, but at least at the level of energy scales, we have uh, a certain handle on that. Um, that is before we can't help being curious about what might happen at higher energies. Um, and okay, so for quite a few uh, decades in energy as we go up, um, to say this famous Planck mass scale that I mentioned earlier. Um, when we go to higher energies, that also corresponds to going to shorter scales. Basically, shorter wavelengths correspond to higher energies. Um, you know, already at the level of the electromagnetic spectrum, you can you can start to see that pattern. Um, one of the beautiful and interesting things about gravitation, though, is that that pattern actually breaks down as you go up further in energy. So as you get this Planck scale, and you try to coalesce more and more matter together, as we discussed with, with one of Dean's um, important questions earlier, uh, you start to form a black hole. And actually, once you do that with more and more matter, the black hole gets bigger and bigger. So after a point, um, this pattern of going to higher energies being corresponding to going to shorter scales um, stops, and instead it goes the other way. That as you go up in energy, you get larger, larger objects. Um, OK. Um, yeah, uh, well, even, please. There, there's, there's a question from Al Zellert. Two questions, actually. First question, Einstein called the cosmological constant his greatest blunder. What are the observations that mean lambda isn't zero? The second question is, how does inflation address the matter-antimatter imbalance? OK, those are great questions. Um, so um, OK, so how we see it, uh, I didn't spend much time on this, but you can see um, some of the labels for the observations that were done. Um, the one that got sort of suddenly famous at, at the time had to do with supernova. Basically, the idea is you have standard candles of um, astronomical objects that behave the same no matter when and where they, they are. Um, and you can use that as a tracer of the uh, ev evolution history of the universe by taking into account um, their, their, um, the light that you see from them and how it would have redshifted, how it would have stretched out over the cosmological history as a function of what that history was. Um, so there's a sensitivity uh, 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 that we get from such astronomical objects. Um, that's one piece here. Another piece is actually the cosmic microwave background um, but interpreted, but used in a different way. So all these, all the structure in this plot that I that I'm uh, briefly presenting here, um, the structure in it uh, is sensitive to those few uh, six independent cosmological parameters. Um, and so this plot would have looked different, not just uh, in a way to do with those initial fluctuations that I was describing here, but also would have looked different. Um, if we didn't have a cosmological constant compared to the fact that we do, that this plot wouldn't have worked. So in other words, the CMB is, is, a, is a very, very um, important um, component of, of these uh, agreeing probes of the cosmological constant. Um, there's something here called BIO, which is related to those peaks, but in a different um, probe through or, or observed through a different, uh, through large scale structure. So there's a, uh, yeah, the, the, these peaks have to do with sound waves in the early universe, and those that scale of those sound waves propagates through to a scale that appears in, in large-scale structure studies as well. So it's a really very, very well-established thing. 
Um, regarding the the you know fun story that it was a blunder, well, um, maybe we'll get there in a little bit. But it's it, in fact, we have a notion in physics of um, what kinds of what kinds of uh, interactions and what kinds of quantities matter at higher energy scales versus mattering more at lower energy scales. The ones that don't matter at low energy are known as irrelevant um, uh, quantities and those that matter at low energies where we reside in it most mostly <laughs> uh, are called relevance. Um, and in fact, the um, cosmological constant is the most relevant quantity that a theorist can consider. So there, there's really no reason to think it's not there. <laughs> so, um, you know, Einstein was phenomenal, but not, not every, uh, you know, everything was known at, at, at his time. And so nowadays we worry more about why it's not any bigger than it is rather than worrying about its uh, existence, in fact. Um, okay, in fact, this, this idea of how we parameterize our ignorance of of high super high energy physics is what I was about to get to. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, there was a second part of the question which I forgot actually. It's sorry. about uh, whether inflation has anything to do with matter antimatter imbalance. Uh, they're pretty independent. They're both problems, but it's 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 um, it's an independent thing. Um, um, so, thanks for the question, but maybe I should, in interest of time, continue. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the uh, so you might say, um, how do we do anything? Like, what if all this stuff we have no experimental probes of or observational probes of, you know, Im impacts what you know we understand at these lower energy scales? And so there's a very beautiful theory of why it is that you know we're not um, uh, completely screwed by. <laughs> the fact that we don't know most of um, the energy scales in physics. And this, this is called Wilsonian effective field theory. Um, and the basic idea is the following. So take any physical quantity, like uh, say the classic problem of force, gravitational force between two objects or you know any, anything you like. Let me consider the gravitational force between two objects, one and two, governed by the Newton constant. So this force, uh, as you might recall from high school physics, takes the form of um, you know, G Newton times mass number one, mass two over uh, the distance R squared between them. Um, so that's, that's, that's the force that you learn in Newtonian uh, gravity. Um, and you know, that also survives into the theory of relativity that we discussed earlier. Um, but now um, suppose as is true that we really only access this for large enough uh, distance, little r, we don't we don't have enough energy to probe super tiny values of this quantity r. So you know we would be none the wiser if there were you know an infinite sequence of other terms um, with some coefficients c one, c two, et cetera, that I wrote here that are say take them to be some numbers around you know order one um, uh, controlled suppressed by, by the ratio of the Newton constant to the distance R squared. So, um, you know, our accelerators and so on definitely get, do not, you know, they peter out way before as we're shrinking R, we get to this Newton constant scale. And so we really wouldn't know anything about these terms. Um, and so, you know, it's okay. Like <laughs> these terms, they're no doubt there, there's some infinite sequence of them and, um, we don't know them, but we also don't need to know them at large, large distances. Um, okay, however, there are really interesting circumstances where even though we work at large distances, what we see is sensitive to such corrections. Okay, and the early universe physics is one of those things. And that's, that's part of the uh, story I want to explain to you a bit. Um, so there, there we have this uh, potential energy of the scalar field phi. Um, and it's good that Dean asked earlier about the kind of macroscopic arguments for, for inflation. Um, so those arguments gave us the idea of inflation, um, uh, gave the people at that time the, the idea for inflation. Um, and you know, there's a quantitative statement there, which is that in order to do this job of, of diluting everything that might've been there and explaining the, the equal temperature almost in all directions, um, 
Yeah, inflation has to last a certain amount of, of um, times. The, the number of uh, times that the universe uh, rescales itself by a, by a power of E, uh, uh, so so-called E foldings, um, is roughly speaking 60, which is a huge expansion of the space. And because of that, this this um, process needs to, uh, in some uh, appropriate measure of time needs to last for a long time and then exit. So um, what that's telling you is that there's a uh, large time scale involved in a large range of the field phi involved um, during the inflationary process. So what that means is um, if we think about the structure of this V of phi in an analogous way to the way we had thought about the structure in the basic Newtonian force on, on this side, we would say, okay, well, we might have some fiducial um, understanding of what the potential energy would be for this field, um, but surely we have to consider the possibility of there being this infinite sequence of corrections, just like we did here. If we assume they're not there, we're making a huge assumption about physics that we have no justification for. Um, and then the very interesting thing about uh, early universe physics is that uh, those kinds of corrections are very important to the success of the theory, meaning you can turn that around and say, if you want a theory of this early universe inflation that is fully principled, um, you really have to have some handle on these um, now quantum gravitational corrections. Uh, so this phenomenon um, is known as uh, UV sensitivity or more interestingly, dangerous irrelevance. Um, and, and it has you know, other avatars. So for example, another, another example is um, that even if you're at low energies, but you have a huge amount of statistics in your data set um, uh, or a lot of time in which to, to observe, your sensitivity naturally increases. Um, an example of that is people look or looked for uh, decay of the proton that would be mediated by some super heavy particle um, in certain theories. Um, and the reason, even though the particle mass would be would be you know not quite as high as the Planck scale, a few orders of magnitude below that, but still nowhere near where we can produce it directly, um, you can look for its effects as long as you have a large enough um, amount of material in which you can. Uh, see possible decays. Um, so in the case of cosmology, you can ask, well, how much data do we have? How many effectively independent experiments do we have? And um, the most uh, recent uh, observation that gave us uh, CMB data um, gives us about 10 to the six pixels. However, that's improving and the large scale structure data that I mentioned is, um, is also adding in a kind of volumes worth of these independent modes in the universe. And so um, this is already a, a large-ish number that allows us to pin down parameters down to a, a value, you know, an uncertainty of order 10 to the minus three um, and it's getting, it's getting better. So it's not, you know, as, it's not arbitrarily large, large amount of data, it's limited, um, but it's large enough to do very, very interesting things. Um, okay, so, um, so just to kind of summarize that, we have this long period of inflation, which gives us sensitivity to, to high energy physics, even some aspects of quantum gravity. Um, uh, and we've got, Lots of data, you can kind of see that by eye in this uh, Planck satellite image uh, of, um, of the CMB. Um, we are sensitive to these tiny fluctuations and there are many independent points here. Okay, so uh, for those reasons, um, you know, we get sensitivity and it becomes very natural to ask this question in, um, quantum gravity theory, which is not a uh, fully known thing, but the uh, best approximation to it that we have, um, which has many successes at the kind of thought experimental level so far, uh, is known as string theory. Um, I'm not gonna really introduce that. It's a, it's a theory of 
uh, microphysics that uh, smooths out singularities that general relativity would predict at short scales and make sense of those. It has, um, uh, as we'll say, see a little bit later, it has an answer to the question of what the microstates of black holes should be. Um, so there are many reasons that we take it seriously as a candidate for quantum gravity. And given what I mentioned earlier, what I've been describing, um, it's motivated to study the problem of inflation in string theory. And when we do that, we find all sorts of interesting results, interesting ways in which uh, the string theory predicts inflationary mechanisms that are kind of relatives of ones that had been considered more from the kind of so-called bottom-up field theory, but really have their own twists to them that make um, interesting predictions. So um, I won't have a chance to explain you know, all of that, but let me give you in pictures of uh, one of the examples um, where if we really are ignorant of the series of terms that are controlled by quantum gravity, um, going back just to show you what I'm talking about, this sort of series of terms, um, if we were really ignorant of, about it, we would just have to anticipate some pretty random functional form for this potential energy V of phi. Um, but for the most numerous fields in, in the string theory, which are called axion fields, um, they are kind of like traditional quantum field theory notions of axions, except uh, they have a certain, um, there's an underlying periodicity for those fields, but the potential adopts a kind of branch structure um, in the case of the string theory versions of axions, on each branch of which you have um, quite you know, automatically a potential energy function that looks like what I've drawn where it's kind of like a parabola toward the middle, but then it flattens out toward the edges um, where inflation would happen. Um, and uh, the system does have a kind of underlying periodicity on top of this uh, extended potential that goes off for large field ranges in, in the units of the Planck scale. Um, so basically, uh, the point that you should get out of this um, is only that if we were totally ignorant, we would have a picture of the potential that was really just based on ignorance. We'd be prescribing these um, terms in some you know, way we really wouldn't have a handle on. But instead, if you look at a theory of quantum gravity and ask about you know, a certain type of field there, you can see a much more regular structure. And you can exploit that to find uh, interesting signatures, as well as you know, just understanding the quantum gravity theory a little bit better. So um, here's some more formulas for those who, who enjoy them. Um, now, including not just the homogeneous expansion with this A of T, uh, but also uh, describing those so crucial fluctuations that I mentioned, which can be organized um, in terms of uh, tensor contributions, which have to do with gravitational radiation, gravitational waves, um, and, and a scalar degree of freedom. There's, a, there's really a large unknown wave function of all of that um, that we're trying to access as much as possible. Um, and we can probe that using various quantities, but it's basically this wave function that we are, are talking about. We can consider what are called correlation functions, sort of averaging the field at two or more points um, within the probability distribution given by the square of the wave function. Um, so there's a, there's a handle on how to go from theory to quantities that we can probe using these large data sets. Um, at the level of the Gaussian theory, I mentioned, you know, I drew a normal distribution, but that's sort of only in one dimension of this field space. The field exists at every point in space or, you know, at every wavelength. And so um, there's a lot of information in that even before we get to uh, the interactions among fields. So, um, for example, the kind of underlying periodicity uh, that I described in this case of axion fields driving inflation gives us uh, predictions for uh, oscillations in the um, scale dependence of the fluctuations. So these would be tiny corrections to the already small number 10 to the minus five, but we have a handle on that because of the large amount of data. 
Um, there's a set of observables still again at the level of the normal distribution um, that I've plotted here where um, the, the vertical axis is the strength of the gravitational wave contribution. The horizontal axis is the uh, first contribution of the um, scale dependence, meaning there's a scale Hubble of the accelerated expansion. It governs uh, the perturbations to the leading order, but there's a very mild dependence on scale of those fluctuations having to do with the exit, with the fact that inflation doesn't last forever. Um, and that gives us a, a number called the tilt of the spectrum NS that appears on a horizontal axis. So the, the observations in the CMB limit the possible values of those things. And the effects that I described from uh, the more complete theory um, takes, for example, the sort of dumbest theory of inflation. I, I don't mean uh, that in a pejorative way. It's sort of the simplest thing you'd think about first, uh, which people did, uh, uh, just a parabola for this V of phi, so phi squared. Um, that model is quite ruled out. Um, something called natural inflation, which is a, a sort of bottom-up theory of axions, um, is also under pressure, um, I think pretty much uh, excluded at this point in a traditional form. Um, but the string theory version where the potential energy flattens out actually because of the effects of high energy um, fields that, that adjust in an energetically favorable way and make it do this, this flattening effect, that pushes in the right direction for the data along with the proliferation of fields. Um, and these models will be tested very, very, very soon. It's the data has been improving. There's been some difficulties with foregrounds that are being um, understood better now. And um, uh, the status of it is, is here. And this, for example, this kind of scenario will be uh, either falsified or supported um, in, in the very next round of observations. Um, so that's already at the level of the kind of normal distribution. Um, and we learned a lot whichever way these things go. If you exclude, you know, axions in string theory, it's a, it's a big um, help because we get uh, a lot of information from that for the theory. Um, and of course, if you see some of the signatures, it's, it's a big deal. Okay, so that was all at the level of the normal distribution. It's um, the case, though, that fields interact. <laughs> uh, and any such interactions at some level uh, lead to correlations among multiple points in this picture. Um, and, you know, there, so that's a very general um, uh, case to consider. And once again, there are um, ways to organize it both from the bottom up and from the point of view of quantum gravity, so-called top down. Um, in the latter case, we get, for example, um, mechanisms in which the reason that the inflation lasts as long as it does is is not because the potential energy is super flat, but instead because the fields interact in such a way that they just can't move faster than uh, a certain amount. In particular, they can work like relativity uh, and not be able to move faster than, um, you know, faster for that for that sort of reason. Um, and a scenario like that uh, gives a prediction for these interactions that is completely distinct from what you would get from um, the case where called slow roll inflation, where the potential is super flat um, and the self interactions of the fields aren't the thing that are that's slowing it down. Um, when it's the case that the self interactions of the field are the thing that's slowing it down, well, that naturally produces much larger interactions and larger correlations that are um, then testable. Okay, so these days we're looking at um, many more aspects of the distribution. And as I mentioned before, it's just in general, it's this huge function, in fact, what we call a functional of fields at every point. Um, and there's a lot of information in there. There's information even beyond these, um, say, low point correlation functions, like three points that I've drawn here. Instead, the distribution can have tails that are quite heavy. And we're looking into that and how it can affect uh, our sensitivity to physics. So um, I think we're coming to the end of the time, but let me just flash just for fun some of those pictures and goings on in this regard. So uh, there's some distribution that could be quite heavy tailed compared to the normal distribution uh, having to do with 
dynamics like production of particles in the early universe from the time dependent physics, the geometry of the field space. Um, and there's a very active area of research in exploiting all of that. On the observational side, it's, it's very bright. There's um, the CMB developments, there's a large scale structure, both a theoretical understanding and, and various surveys that are developing to um, make the most of what we can see in the universe. So um, let me just stop there because I think we're, we're at the end. I won't get to describe for you the microphysics of the horizon, the microstates, but that's just fine. I mean, um, uh, so let me stop there and ask for any, any remaining questions. Thank you, Eva. That was really interesting stuff. Great talk. Um, there are a, a few questions. So uh, there is a, a question by Chris Gould. Is there an explanation of why Lambda is so small? That's a wonderful question. Um, I would say yes. Now, this this kind of uh, uh, question is still still you know an active question, um, uh, and you know people kind of react strongly. Sort of, it's one of these things where you love it or you hate it. Um, but let me explain the explanation that I that I favor, um, uh, and I think it's kind of a conservative explanation. So, um, so it, it it basically the idea is that. We, what we're seeing is a selection effect. So in general, when we observe things in the universe, I'm going to go back way back to uh, one of the earlier pictures here. Um, so when we observe, um, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, when we observe um, things in the universe, uh, we, we naturally, you know, select for certain easier to see things than other, otherwise. So for example, um, um, you know, when we see certain astronomical objects, we, we only see the brighter ones compared to the less bright ones. And that's, that's known as a selection effect. And you have, to, you have to correct for that when you interpret your observations. Um, another kind of question you could ask is, um, you know, most of, most of the universe is empty space or not quite empty, but you know, you know, not planet. So why do we see a planet? <laughs> why are we here on Earth? And the answer to that, of course, is obvious. We wouldn't exist, you know, in, in empty space. With the cosmological constant, there's a perfectly good explanation that's of that nature, which is saying, well, most of the universe could well be such that quantum fluctuations um, have generated a humongous cosmological constant that the cosmological or the potential energy for the fields in general is generically quite high. Um, and that's certainly the case in a, a theory such as string theory, where most sources of stress energy um, are positive and there's you know, many ways that they can organize themselves to be at a much higher scale. Um, so you could say, well, why don't we observe that? And the answer can be as simple as, as what I said about the planets, which is to say, well, you wouldn't exist to see it. Um, so this is known, so, you know, I like to call this a, just another selection effect. Um, that's the polite way of saying uh, another term, which is called the anthropic principle, which is, you know, just that it's okay, we have to sometimes interpret what we see uh, based on the fact that, you know, it may well not be typical in the, in the universe, but um, we wouldn't, you know, exist to see it otherwise. So that's, you know, that, that at least fits all the facts that we have, um, both observationally and from the perspective of the rich landscape of um, uh, cosmological solutions in, say, string theory as a, as a proposal for the theory of quantum gravity. Um, doesn't mean that what I said uh, here, um, which goes back to, you know, ideas of Linde and Weinberg and others, um, doesn't mean that it's the right explanation, but it's, a, it's the only viable one that I know. Um, the problem is, you know, it appears very, very fine-tuned if you if you don't take that view. Um, maybe that someone will find some elegant explanation that has, you know, no need for interpreting it as a selection effect. But but generally in science, you know, some things are and some things aren't selection effects. We don't we all accept that, you know, there are many things that are selection effects and other things that have uh, dynamical explanations. Um, so um, yeah, I hope that helps with your question. Okay. Well, thank you, Eva, very much. There are other questions, but in the interest of time, I think we will end the formal part of the webinar now. And thank you, everybody, for coming. For those of you who want to uh, stay and, and ask uh, Eva questions privately, go ahead and, and stay on. But otherwise, thank you for coming. Have a great rest of your weekend.